guys. Good morning. Good morning. All right. I know you guys have been hearing this word a lot, Superman. I know we're going to be having a Superman Sunday. And I know there's women here. So for the women, it's a Superwoman Sunday. Okay? Because it still applies to you. All right? The word super is actually interesting because it pretty much just means above normal standard. So if you think of a man, you're like, here's the standard of a man, and now go above it. <laughs> now you're a Superman or a Superwoman. Right? And don't you guys want to be super? Yeah. Yes. Come on. When you're all kids, you're all like, what kind, what kind of superhero do you want to be? All of you guys had a superhero. So I'm like, y'all want to be like Spider-Man because he has strength, throws webs, swings around, whatever I mean. Some of you guys, I want to be like Superwoman. All of you guys at some point are like, you know what? I want to be higher than the standard I have for myself. You know, even it could be one of the higher integrity. And it's interesting because when I think of super, I think of things that are above the standard. And in God's standard, there's a couple of things that I want to focus on today. And then we're, we're going to be focusing on today. Now, I'm not the only one preaching. And I'm not, I'm not going to... We, we decided to do it a three duel here. So we're going to have Chris preaching as well. He's going to start us off. Then we're going to have Quentin preach right after him. And then I'm going to close it out. I'm just kind of kicking it off here. But I want you to think a couple of things. You, we, we need to be a superman or a superwoman in what? In our purity. Because that's where your strength is. You have to be a superman or a superwoman in the call to your singleness. Quentin's going to address that. <laughs> because that is literally the call for some of us. And you have to be a superman or a superwoman in the commitment of your marriage. This does address to the singles too. I'll address that later. But to start us all off, I'll give it over to Chris to start us off with purity. Amen, family. Let's turn our scriptures over to Matthew chapter 5. We're going to get right into it. I hope you guys like Bible study. So I've been given the charge be a Superman in your purity. And so I, another way I like to think of the title is a pure offering to the Lord. <laughs> Matthew chapter five, verse eight, Jesus gives us an incredible insight here. Well, let's first say a quick word of prayer. God in heaven, I pray that you move all of the speakers aside today. God, that we would speak nothing but your word, Lord, into these people, into your people. Lord, you feed our hearts as well. God, and I, I just thank you so much for being our sovereign Lord. Father, for teaching us, feeding us, God, that there's no life without you. God, without you, there is literally nothing, God, and that if this we don't catch this word, God, we won't be able to change our lives accordingly. God, so I pray that, Lord, people leave here with a changed heart, a changed spirit, a changed mind, a changed willingness to commit to you fully. We love you, Lord, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Matthew 5, verse 8, it says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God, right? And so really there aren't many things that we can offer God except for a pure heart. Really, if you think about it, God gives us every single thing that we have. But the one thing that he lets us have be our choice is to have a pure heart. So it's the only thing that we can really offer back to God. And, and what's incredible here is that Jesus says that blessed are the pure in heart because they will see God. Right, so there's actually something interesting here that you could easily miss. You could think that this is, oh, it's like a really religious statement. Like, this sounds really, this sounds pretty. But no, what, what's really in fact is, is that you cannot see God if you don't have a pure heart. So the pure heart actually allows us to see God, right? So it's actually the condition of your heart will determine the condition of your eyes. So have you ever felt that it's hard to see God's hand in your life when one, you're in sin, two, you're bitter at someone, or three, you're prioritizing yourself. You know, people, people think God has completely abandoned them because they hold on to these things because they're lacking a pure heart. They think, oh, God has left me. I'm too far gone. I've sinned too much. But what's really blinding them is the lack of a pure heart. God's actually there with them trying to get them to have a pure heart, but they're stopping themselves from seeing God because the condition of their heart is blinding them. And so the more your heart is like God's, the more you're going to be able to see him. So to understand what it means to be pure, we also have to understand what it means to be unpure. So we're going to do a little Bible study today, a two-parter. So the first part is purity. Let's look over here in Philippians 1. Come on, brother. Come on, brother. So who here wants to see God today? Amen. So we're going to learn how to do that. 
Philippians chapter one, as we turn there together. I love the sound of turning pages. We are Bible church, are we not? Yes. We love the Bible. So in chapter one, verse nine, the Bible says this. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. This is an incredible. My brother Paul gave this prayer, wrote this prayer down while being inspired by the Holy Spirit. And so he's writing this down. He says, this is the prayer that you may abound in love more and more so that you're able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless. So, so the goal is love, but the medium to get to love is being pure and blameless. Or let's look over here in Philippians 2, next, literally on the same page for me. Philippians 2, 12, it says, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but how, now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. You know, how, how is your obedience to God? Is it, does it lack when there's a lack of accountability? You know, when no one's around, do you still be a Christian? Or does a new personality take over? The one that's underneath, or is that gone? You gotta evaluate yourself, wow. right? With fear and trembling. Let's look at Philippians 4. You know, there's, there, you gotta have purity in God. You got to have purity in life. And there's another thing that we got to look at here. Purity in thought. Philippians 4, verse 8 says, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice, and the God of peace will be in you. And so have you ever heard of, Submitting your thoughts to Christ? Well, there's actually a way to do it. It's not just about getting rid of old thoughts. You ever heard, if, if you destroy a tower, right, but you don't erect a new one, all that's left is rubble. So if you destroy something, if you get rid of your old thoughts, you're only having rubble. And then the same saying that Jesus said is true, that if you get rid of a spirit in a house, you clean up the place, and you don't fill it with anything, Seven more spirits more wicked than the last are going to come and fill that place. So if we don't replace our thoughts, all of them, with these things, more is going to come that's more wicked than the last. Because you're tolerating what's already there. So first you got to destroy the tower. Then you got to clean up the rubble. And then you got to build a new one. One that stands in the presence of God. Amen. So I, I, I don't know about you, you, but I love diving into the original language of the Bible. The Bible is written in three different languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. Hebrew and Aramaic for the, for the old, a little bit of Aramaic in the new, but then mostly Greek in the new. And so we're going to break down the words pure and impure. So pure occurs 129 times in the Bible. In the Hebrew, it means pure clean in three different ways, physically, morally, and ceremonially, which is a, a presentation to God. And then the Greek means clean, innocent, modest, exciting reverence, which I thought was really interesting because God views a pure heart as someone who's excited and reverently worshiping him and blameless. And so pure, even in the Levitical sense, going back to the Old Testament, because this is a Bible study, and we're actually going to look from the old to the new, Genesis to Revelation, pure in the Levitical sense is to partake in things unforbidden to impart no uncleanness. So meaning that like if I was to hold my phone, I wouldn't become impure by it. But in a Levitical sense, if someone had leprosy or some kind of disease, that uncleanness could actually transfer into me and change my spiritual well-being. That's called being ceremonial. Maybe I'm not morally unclean, but I'm now ceremonially unclean and unfit to enter into the presence of God. So we're going to look at why these matter. If we look over at Genesis chapter 1, we're going to see why God wants us to be pure. And there's a specific reason. In Genesis 1, 27, it says, So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Now, it says it twice because it's important, right? It says male and female, he created them. So three times, God created people. Yeah. And it says that he created us in his own image. 
and in the image. Now, in other translations, it says in the likeness. It says image and likeness. So it's to be looking like God and to be like God. And so God didn't just create us to look like him so he could look at us and stare at us. He wanted us to act like him as well. We were supposed to be representatives of God in the garden. But we messed up and we got kicked out of the garden. But that doesn't mean we can't try to do what God wanted us to do because that's actually his will for us is to be like Christ Jesus in him, right? And so to be pure is to be attaining, to be shooting to like, be like God, right? And so God has always done everything purely, right? So God actually designed us to be pure. So God's never gonna ask you to do something that he hasn't enabled you to do, right? So let's look at 1 Timothy chapter one. We're gonna see something here interesting. First Timothy one. And as I was studying this out, I was really convicted because it, another condition was set by the scriptures. First Timothy chapter one, verse five, it says the goal of this command is love, right? And we've been studying out love, right? We studied out unconditional love, what love that is. We studied out a lot of love this month, right? So the goal of the commands of the Bible is love, yeah. right? Teaching the Bible, the goal is love, but it says this, it says, which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. So without a, with a lacking of these three, there can actually be no true love. Without a pure heart, a sincere faith and a good conscience, there can be no love. And so we see that what, what, that actually creates false love when you're in absence of one of these things. When this is a love, a false love is one that seeks to gain rather than to give. Right, a, an impure heart wants to take, even if you think you're like, oh no, I'm, I'm doing this for a good reason. If it's impure, you know it's deep in your heart, and it's 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 seeking to rob others so that you could have joy, which you won't attain because no joy comes from false love. So I want to ask, where is your heart today? Are you have a pure heart today? You know, in First John four, it talks about how if we if we really love one another, then God is within us right and so it talks about loving each other right so if we don't love each other god cannot be in us right because god is love so we see if we don't have a pure heart we can't even be connected to god hence reinforcing what jesus said that we can't even see god it's just like what he said in john 3 you can't see the kingdom unless you're born again so let's go into impurity now so what stops us it's actually impure right so the greek and hebrew word for that is it occurs 172 times in the bible so the, I, I thought the hebrew understanding was really deep because all of their understandings really connect around the idea of having a relationship with god so the the definition here is to be unclean or defiled sexually or by idolatry or by or ceremonially Right, so we talked about that would be like if you touch something dead, you would then be unclean. Right, but then the third, the fourth thing that I thought was interesting is says to profane God's name. Right, oh, okay, that's wh wh where are we getting with this? Right, so if we look into the Greek, we're gonna put a pin in that one. We're gonna look at the Greek. It means to be unclean in the physical sense and in the moral sense, and it means having impurity of lust, luxurious or profligate. I think I said that right. Living impure or impure motives. Right, so it's all conditions of like psyche and heart. So impurity, it actually stems from idolatry. It stems from the idolatry of ourselves and it is fueled by deluded fantasies in our minds that we try to make into realities, right? So it's actually us trying to play God and push God away. That's true, that's the, so in, uh, sorry, impurity is actually only a symptom. It's a symptom of a much greater issue of idolatry let's look at leviticus chapter 10 leviticus chapter 10 starting here in verse 8 it says then the lord said to aaron you and your sons are not to drink wine or other fermented drink whenever you go into the tent of meeting right and so to give some preface the tent of meeting this is where god dwelled in the tabernacle in the exodus period of the israelites when they left egypt to go to the promise so they had to have a place where god dwelled with them Right? And so the God uh, was in a cloud above the tabernacle and he was also in the tabernacle and he sat on the glory street and the, and the holiest of holies. And we see here, if we keep reading, it says, or you will die. Right? So if they drank wine and entered into the thing, they would literally 
die, fall on their face and die. And so you'd be like, why? Why, why would this happen? All right, so we're going to read a little more and get some context. It says, this is a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. So a lasting ordinance means it's, it's never going to go away. Now, this is not a punishment, but it's more a reaction to what's happening. It's a spiritual reaction. Now, we can only see physically, but this is actually a spiritual reaction to what is happening to impure when it enters into the holiest presence of God. All right, it says, so that you can distinguish between the holy and the common, between the unclean and the clean. And so you can teach the Israelites all the decrees the Lord has given them through Moses. So where can we see this today, actually? It actually happens more often than not. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Come on, Jesus. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Oh, I said, I hope you guys like the Bible. Verse 27 says, So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner it will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we were more discerning, let that not be said about us. With regard to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. Nevertheless, we, so when we are judged in this way by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be finally condemned with the world. So this happens now, and there's a lot more grace at play with Jesus Christ. But this happens because of the Levitical decree and ordinance that's lasting, right? Because we see it's the sinfulness of impurity wasn't to technically actually remain as the impure being. Because if it was ceremonially, that's not technically the sin. The sin was actually entering into God's presence while being impure. And so entering into God's presence. Now think about this. If we're going to go to the sun, what's going to happen? You're going to burn up, right? Because the sun is just too magnificent. It's too powerful. And in the same way, as we're covered in sin, it's the same thing as going into God's presence. We'll burn up. It's what happens. And so in the same way, as, as in one of the prophet's books, uh, he was touched on the lips by a hot coal. And, and, and instead, he's like, bang, God's like, no, I'm an impure man. Like, don't, don't let me come near you. He's touched on the lips. And instead of being destroyed, the coal drove out the impurity, right? So we see that there's something that we need to have that will drive out the impurity in us to let us be in the presence of God. Let's look at Ephesians chapter three. And so we see that when we take the cup in an unworthy manner, it is us entering into the Lord's presence. And what we are, we're presenting ourselves to him. And as we look in Genesis, we're the image of God. And so if we're not like him in looks and in deeds, we're actually showing him a twisted image, something that he hates. Now, there's, like we talked about, there's a, there's a way to get that coal, right? The coal that we talked about to drive out the impurity. Let's look at Ephesians 5. Come on, Chris. Come on, Chris. Ephesians chapter 5. It says here in verse 3. It says, but among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. As we saw, we saw what would need to replace our thinking life, right? If we think about the things that are pure, right, holy, noble, these things won't come out of our mouth, right? But let's keep reading. It says, for of this, you can be sure. No immoral, impure, or greedy person. Such a person is an idolater, right? We see symptoms of idolatry here. Has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. So we see that if we live a lifestyle like this, it says, it says very plainly and clearly, this you can be sure. You have no inheritance in heaven. Our lifestyle matters, family. The way we live matters. Because if we, if we take the grace of God, and live a, a, a life that's not worthy of what he's given us, we spit in his face once more. So deep down, we as humans, we, we love to be impure. We love to be sexually immoral. We love to be greedy. 
but it, 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 it comes from us wanting to be making ourselves our own gods, right? And so we have to repent, right? This is, this is what we're going to do. You, I want to challenge you, read, study out Luke 15, I'm sorry, Luke 13, verse 5, and you're going to see what has to happen. We need to repent and be cleansed by the blood of Jesus in order to be, one, look like God, because coated in the blood of Jesus lets God see us as if we were Jesus. And then two, cleansed by the blood of of Jesus, which will now allow us to live the life according with his spirit. Amen. Right? And so let's look at Psalm 15. Come on, Chris. Come on, Lord. Come on, Chris. Amen. Psalm chapter 15. Starting here in verse four, it says, but their idols, so we're going to talk about idols. It says, but their idols are silver and gold made by human hands. They have mouths, but cannot speak eyes, but cannot see. They have ears, but cannot hear noses, but cannot smell. They have hands, but cannot feel feet, but cannot walk, nor can they utter a sound with their throats. Those who make them will be like them. And so will all who trust in them. Impurity is an idol. It is an idol of your soul. And without repentance, you cannot be refreshed. You cannot be changed. You need to repent of yourself as being God, making your own decisions. God has to make these decisions for you. You need to study the Bible. Let's look over here as we get ready to close in our last two scriptures. Ephesians 4. What's the result of us continually giving into idolatrous pleasures, impurities, which is more than just sexual? It's not purity is more than just a state of being, right? We know it's it's actually a treasure that allows us to be in the presence of God. And impurity takes away the treasure. It's us saying, this is not a treasure at all. What a treasure is to me is my sin. And we can't have that heart. Philippians, I'm sorry, Ephesians 4, verse 17. So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. And we see that these are the things that will stop you from getting to heaven. We cannot live like we once lived before. Once you hear the word, you have a decision to make, and it's not on your time. It's on God's time. Because you don't know when the next time you'll be able to hear this. And this could be your last. So I have to warn you, this, as you step out of this room today, this could be the last time you hear the word of God. Evaluate. Really see, are you living an idolatrous life or a godly driven life? Let's look over here in verse 20. That, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life. So we were taught to about our former way of life, the way we live, because that's what we know, right? And it says, to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. So don't you know that your desires are actually deceiving you, thinking you're going to get what you want. But in reality, you're going to fulfill Luke chapter nine, which is, if you save your life now, you'll lose it. And what's it worth if you have to, everything to gain in this world, but eventually it all gets burned out. So let's continue to read. It says, to be made new in the attitude of your mind and to put on the new self, Peter, to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Right? So we see that we need to fulfill this. So how do we get there? Verse 28. It says here, anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. Right? So we see that repentance is no longer just destroying you can't just stop doing something. You have to turn around yeah. and walk the other way, right? So if you were stealing, you now have to give generously. If making people was an idol, you now have to love them the right way. Yeah. 
in a selfless way. Now, if you're selfless and idle, you have to get rid of yourself. You have to crucify it. Whatever the tendencies of your flesh is, it has to die. It has to repent. Repent from false love. Repent from not loving the way that God wants you to love. Repent from selfishness. Repent from not giving. Re repent on being obsessed with yourself. You know, in Romans 8, it talks about, we're not turning, because we're, we're running out of time. But in Romans 8, there's two things that are fighting for you. There's the flesh and the spirit. Who of these will be your guide to your final destination? The flesh leads to destruction, and the spirit lives to life and peace. Yes, Lord. Which one do you want? You know, I think of, as we close out here in Revelation 7, God paints an amazing picture. Yeah. Right? As, and if we recall how Jesus was welcomed into Jericho, I mean, not Jericho, I'm sorry, Jerusalem, J word, Jerusalem. Uh, we see that he was welcomed in as he rode a donkey into Jerusalem and palm fronds were laid down at his feet and they're being waked around and they're saying, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. And in the same way, if we have a pure heart, you know, the song we sang right before here was, if my robes are white, if my heart is right, this, is, this was chosen not to be a catchy tune, but as a prayer, as a plea to God petitioning God. God, make my heart pure. Let me wear these robes of white. Because in Revelation 7, it says that when we all get to be with Jesus, when he's finally done wiping away every last tear, when the old is forgotten, when there's no more pain or grief or sorrow, we'll be in robes of pure white. Amen. And it says that we'll also have palm fronts, which you may think, okay, you know, I grew up in California and there was palm trees all over the place, but but the, the real meaning of palm fronds, it's not just a tropical, luxurious, it, it actually stands for victory in the biblical sense. So when we're raising these palm fronds and waving them around and setting them before the eternal king, wearing robes of white, with no more pain, no more sorrow, because we've persevered through the pain now, we're going to be waving palm fronds of victory and praising God eternally. I love you all. To God be all. Well, thank you, Chris, uh, for that awesome message. Today, I'm going to talk about the call to be single and be a Superman in doing so. You know, I find it very interesting that when you talk to people, a lot of people want to be married. Yeah. And a lot of people I talk to do not want to be single. They look at it as the worst time of their lives. My goodness, I can't tell you how many people are like, man, if I'm single the rest of my life, I don't know if I can love God. What? But that's what we're going to talk about today. How can we be superman and superwomen in our singleness? You know, I think if you think about Superman, one of the characters that also accompanies Superman is uh, Lois Lane. And everybody wants to find their Lois Lane for the women. They all want to find their Prince Charming. I know I'm very grateful for my Lois Lane, Miss Courtney Barnett. But I got to ask you, this morning, how many people here want to be like Jesus? That's a lot of hands. I don't know if you guys know anything about Jesus, but he was single his whole life. Some of the hands went down. I don't know if I want to be like Jesus anymore. But I'm glad we can all agree that we want to be more like Jesus. And you know what? There were some great men and women in the Bible who were married. So I'm not here to talk down about dating. I'm not here to talk down about marriage. But what I am here to talk about this morning is how we can lead the way in our singleness. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Let's look at what, what Paul had to say about being single. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, in verse 7, it says, I wish that all of you were as I, uh, were as I am, but each of you has your own gift from God. One has this gift, another has, uh, uh, another has that. So first things first, Paul's like, look, it's a gift to be able to be single. And in some ways, he's kind of talking to the Corinthian church, and he's like, hey, yeah, amen. You guys don't have the gift. Some of you don't. Amen. <laughs> but let's keep reading. It says, 
Now to the unmarried and to the widows, I say it is good for them to stay unmarried as I do. But if they cannot control themselves, they should marry for it's better to marry than to burn with passion. I remember reading this passage as a, a teenager and I was like, yeah, I, I don't know if I have Paul's gift. Uh, but, but I remember reading this and I remember thinking to myself, why, why is it better to be single? Why, how would it be better for me to be alone? Come on. And you know what I missed in that moment is the fact that God was trying to share with me that I was never alone. But sometimes it can be very easy for us to go to a mall or go walking around and we see that, that, that couple holding hands and we go, man, I, I wish I was dating. I wish, I wish that was me. And then you go home at night and you pray and you're like, God, why do you hate me? But what you don't know is that you don't know what's going on in that relationship. And a lot of the times the relationships that you see that are the ideal relationships are filled with all kinds of terrible things. They're full of idolatry. They're full of adultery at times. They're full of greed. They're full of heartache. And I know for me, coming into the kingdom, I was like, I cannot date without God ever again. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And the reason why is because the standard of love is very clear. In 1 Corinthians 13, we have a, a roadmap, if you will, of how we should love and the qualities of love. It says love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrong. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But yet, if you look at relationships in the world, it's a sad sight. Because love is super conditional in the world today. And yet, there's one person, there's one God who loves you unconditionally. And he wants to show you what love truly looks like. Come on, bro. But yet we want to rush into relationships. I know for me that I would be a terrible boyfriend to Courtney if I didn't learn how to love God first. It would look something like this. I love unless you get on my nerves. I will be kind if you are kind to me. I'm not going to be envious unless I want to be. I'm not going to boast until I do something that is worth boasting about. I'm not proud. You're proud. I'm not going to dishonor you until you say something, until you say the wrong thing. That, that, then it's fair game. I don't care about myself. I'm not self-seeking until I feel like you don't appreciate me enough. And then we got a problem. I'm not, I'm not easily angered. You get on my nerves too much. It keep, I don't keep any records of wrong, but you know that you keep doing this thing. So I have to talk to you about the thing you keep doing. I'm not an evil person. I'm a good guy. Look at, look at everybody. People say I'm nice. I'm never delighted evil. What is truth? I mean, truth is kind of subjective, isn't it? I sure hope we don't think that, amen. I'll protect you until the guy comes who's a little bit bigger than me, and then I gotta go. I know, I know my limits. I'm gonna trust you until you give me a reason not to. I, I'll, I'll persevere in this 
until I get bored or it gets too hot. And to tell you guys the truth, all of those things were the things that I embodied in the world. And, and I was in relationships and I was wondering, why, why isn't this working, God? But it came back to this. Let's go to Psalms chapter 37. Psalm chapter 37. Let's go to verse four, where it says this. It says, take the light in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord, trust in him and he will do this. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. The reason that we are called to be single with God is so that we can embody this scripture. It says that if you take delight in God, that's when you will receive your righteous reward. But I feel there is a, a, a trend going on in the world today that people use God as like a credit card. God, I'm gonna seek after you so that I can get the girl that I want. And then once I get her, meh, I'll come back when I'm ready. And you know, it's sad because people miss out on what the reward really is. Because if we're being honest, man, dating is awesome. Being engaged is awesome. Being married is awesome. But there is nothing, and I mean nothing, as amazing and awesome as a relationship with God. But yet, people will look at their singleness as a punishment. My goodness. God, you don't, you don't love me. If you did, you would give me what I want. Oh, what? How does that, how does that sound? God loved you enough to send his son down on this earth to die for your sins. And yet sometimes we have the audacity to look at God and say, you don't love me because you didn't give me what I want. But maybe he's protecting you from the very thing that will pull you away from him. And yet you have the audacity to look at him and say, he did you wrong. I remember when I was... Uh, Man, how old was I? I was like 18 or 19 years old. And I remember my mom and I were talking. My mom and my dad had recently uh, departed from the ICOC to, to move, come to the ICC. And they were a part of the church in Milwaukee. And I, I would go to church every Sunday. And at that time, I thought I had it all figured out. I, I, was, I, was, I was going off to, to be married and all these things. And I remember me and my mom having a conversation. And she very earnestly asked me, what was it going to take for me to become a disciple? And I remember looking at her and I was like, you know, I'm going to be honest with you, mom. I'm, I'm kind of scared that if I seek after God with all my heart, that he's going to call me to give up something that I'm not ready to give up. And that thing that he was calling me to give up, I knew was, was my relationship. And the sad truth of it was, is that I, idolized that relationship more than I loved God. I idolized myself more than I loved God. And, and everything that Chris talked about in, in his lesson, that, that was fully me. But I remember very vividly telling my mom that if God took this relationship away from me, I don't know if I could ever forgive him. And then God put me to the test. <laughs> God looked at me and he said, all right, bet. <laughs> and he took that relationship away like that. And he showed me how fragile and fleeting love is in the world. And for those of you who know me, I don't cry a lot. But man, oh man, I was, I was like a little baby. I, was, I had the ugly cries. I had snot going, oh, how could you do this to me, God? 
But little did I know that it would lead to, to something so great. That it would lead to me being able to, to become a disciple. That it would lead me to be able to learn how to truly love God. And then, and only then, did the woman who God wanted me to be with came into my life. And I think about that often. I think about, first of all, how unworthy I am to, to date in God's kingdom. And I think about how singleness for such a long time was the thing that kept me away from God. But my challenge for us this morning is, is these three things. Number one is learn true contentment. You see, so often we think we're content in our relationship with God. And the one way I knew I was the most discontent is whenever somebody would start dating, I would get bitter. <laughs> oh my goodness, God, when is it my turn? And I was like, one-year-old spiritually, I didn't even know what I was doing. I wasn't ready to lead anybody, let alone lead myself. And I was over here trying to talk to God about like, God, you should let me start dating. I think we should, I think we should bargain something out. <laughs> but when I learned true contentment, I found a freedom like never before. What I was able to achieve was, was a life that was full of just adventures with me and God and no one else. I remember there'd be times that it would be like midnight, one o'clock at night, and I'd be walking down by the lake just praying. And people are looking at me like, this, what is this dude? Do? It is 20 degrees outside, and it is one. Why is he walking out here? And I didn't care. I was, it was my time with God. And I would remember waking up super early in the morning, and I'd be like, man, I'm just going to go on an adventure with God today. Amen. That's the freedom of your uninterrupted time with God. Amen. But I'd also implore you to learn true love. Come on. If you lack anything that was referenced in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and I mean anything, maybe it's time to refine those before you bring somebody else into the equation. Because I know for me, I'm not perfect, but man, God sure did a lot of refining on a lot of those qualities in my heart before he brought Courtney into my life. Because he wanted to spare Courtney all the, ter the headache. But point number, the ch my third challenge is to be joyful in your singleness. Everybody, I hope, that is a disciple wants to be different than the world. Yeah. But I'm here to tell you that you're no different than the world that if you're single and you grumble. That's, I have friends like that in the world all the time. I had friends who were guys, I had friends who were girls, and, and the one thing we'd always talk about, it always end up somehow being about how they're single, and I don't get it. Well, what's wrong with me? I'm like, there's a lot of things wrong with you. Where do you want to start? And they'd be looking at me like, you're mean. And I'm like, you asked the question. <laughs> but like, how can we exclaim to love God the way that we do and yet resent being alone with him and alone. I got, a, I got a, a really fun fact for all of us here today. There's no marriage in heaven. Mike Whitson. So if you hate God, has spent a time with God on earth, you gone. You are really going to dislike heaven. I'm going to be honest with you guys. There ain't, no, there ain't no husband. There ain't no wife in heaven. You going to pull up. It's going to be you and God for eternity. So I really hope that you guys do not resent time with God. I hope that every single day you're falling more and more in love with God. Because that's what heaven's going to be. You're going to spend eternity with him. But the call to be single, I also want to really encourage us, is not a, it's, it's not a punishment. That's right. The call to be single is is an opportunity 
to learn true love, to learn unconditional love. But at the end of the day, what it really is, is it's a privilege. I love you guys, and to God be all the good. Guys, hope you're, you're ready. Now, I don't know if you guys, like I said, it was going to be a Superman Sunday, right? Superwoman Sunday. So we decided we're going to give you three lessons, right? Now, I hope you guys got, 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 got some good stuff from, uh, from what Chris preached, right? And you got to got a little refinement from what Quentin preached. But remember that literally purity is where your strength comes. If you don't get it now, now you do. You know, each of us are, are, are called to a certain lifestyle. And it's a certain lifestyle that you we live. We all go through singlehood. Why? Because we have to learn unconditional love. Yeah. But now I want to call you guys to the last thing. To be a Superman, you have to be a Superman in the commitment to your marriage. Right. Okay. You're like, how does that even apply to me as a single person? I mean, because you're talking about singlehood. Well, you guys, you guys have to remember that in Ephesians 5, verse 25, it reads, husbands, love your wives as Christ love the church christ was the first husband and if you're part of the church you have a husband you are single but jesus is your husband spiritually speaking are you committed to your husband as christ is committed to you okay for the guys you're all the white the woman too by the way so fired up bro. <laughs> yes understand. we all have to submit we're all submitting to christ now, I want to I want to change your mindset just a little bit. So I want to go to Romans 12, verse 1. Okay, so I hope you guys are ready. Yeah, Romans 12, verse 1 reads, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. The definition of holy in the Greek kind of translates to kadosh, which means holy, which pretty much means this, to be set apart, the exact opposite of something that is common. Let's think about marriage for a second in the world. What is the common marriage in the world? It's something that can end. It's opposite. It's not until death do you part. Ooh. It's something that can be dishonored. Ooh. You don't honor the marriage bed. You're not loyal to it. You're not faithful to your wife. It's okay to be unfaithful. Some of you guys are like, I'm just telling you guys. Something that is disrespected. You guys, you guys tell me it's not true. Disrespected. Where the form is like, you can be in a commitment, in a marriage, and yet it's okay for your husband or your wife to lust for older women or other men while in the marriage. It's okay. Wow. I don't know. I know marriage is like this. Something that is not a vow. There's no eternal commitment to one another. There's not a commitment to it. What do we forgotten? We've forgotten exactly what the vow of marriage really is. You guys want me to remind you guys what it is? Oh, no. God. It says, in the name of God. This is a traditional vow. This is a vow that pretty much everybody does, even though they don't realize it. But this is what, God, this is what we don't talk about. In the name of God, I, for example, me, take you, what? To be my wife or husband, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better or for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish until part, parted by death. This is my solemn vow. Okay. Sounds pretty good. Pretty about. <laughs> what does that show? It shows exactly what a traditional love is. It's committed. It perseveres. It always trusts. It's not going to abandon you. Isn't that exactly what all of you guys are looking for? Yeah. I know, guys, you, you agree with that. I know you don't want to nod your head, but you're like, okay. Not I know the girls are like, yes, sure, yes, yes. <laughs> the guys are like, but I got you guys. We're all, we're all looking for the same thing, okay? Why? Because we're all looking for unconditional love. And we see unconditional love through Jesus Christ. Now, we have to remember that there's something very unique about the marriage here. In Romans 12, verse 1, it said, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. We all heard of this, but we don't fully understand that when we get married, what happens? You become one. Spiritually speaking, 
all of you guys, when you got baptized, you came into a marriage vow with Jesus and you became one as his wife when you were, became one in the church. You became one flesh, meaning that your husband has decided to take upon themselves all the commitment, all the sin, all of it to make sure that you make it to heaven. That's what, that's what Jesus did for you. He was literally the first person to be a full-blown husband in every possible way. That should be encouraging for all, you know, single women there. The guys are like, well, this is also our calling. Why do I say that? Well, in Genesis 20, verse 22, it says this. Okay. I'm sorry, in Ephesians 5, verse 31. Oh, amen. <clears throat> My apologies. I'm going to jump to Ephesians in a minute. I'm saying Genesis. Ephesians 5, verse, 20, uh, verse 31, it says, For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Mm -hmm. So we see here that literally it's called to one flesh. And if you look at Romans 12, verse 1, it says that what is pleasing to God is what? To offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. As a married couple, what are you doing? You're offering your body as a living sacrifice, but one that is bonded in unison as one. Is your life, when you're worshiping God, is it in unison with Jesus when you're worshiping? Those are spiritually speaking are single, but you're, you're spiritually married. Are you fully always united in oneness with Jesus himself and your commitment of your own personal marriage? And for those that are married, is your marriage fully committed to still being married with God? Because you were married with God before you were married to your husband or your wife. You said yes to God first. That's what it says. That uh, according to your strands can't be easily broken. Like God's just joining you in the marriage. You're like, yeah, God's husband, you can join me. Wife, you can join us. God's already in it. Y'all got real quiet. <laughs> yeah, they did. Well, help us. But what was the... What was the whole point? Let me let me hope you understand the core of three stands here. Let's go to Genesis chapter 20. You have to understand that in the beginning, who had a relationship first? God had a relationship first with Adam before his wife had a relationship with him. Okay? God's like, I love you, Adam. You're awesome. We, we worked the garden together. But then he notices that Adam, like, you know what? It's not good for him to be alone. All right? So it goes in Genesis 20, starting um, Genesis... Genesis 1? Genesis. Yeah, Genesis 1? Yeah. Starting verse 20. My apologies, guys. We're, we're with you, bro. It's all good. <clears throat> Genesis 1, right, Quentin? Yeah, Genesis 1, verse 20. So the man gave names to all the livestock, and we were referring to Adam, the birds in the sky and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. Right? So the Lord God caused the man to fall into deep sleep, and while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of men, and he brought her to the man. Now, this is very important because what do we see here is that God actually saw that man needed help. Yeah. So he put together from his own rib, woman. Now, guys, this is referencing you guys. Do you understand you can't be made complete until you actually find the woman or the suitable helper that God has made for you? Oh. Because you were supposed to make it to heaven as one. Because you were made as one. And now he's bringing you back. Now, why do, we, why do I say this? Well, we have to realize that the reason this is here is because he's trying to help us understand that God was always looking for your best interest. God was always having a relationship with you that was unconditional to the point that he actually gave you a suitable helper. And in this case, he gave Adam a suitable helper, and that was a woman. And it actually brings us to Proverbs 18, verse 22. He who finds a wife finds what is good and receives favor from the Lord. In Genesis, it's very clear. He's like, no, it's not good for you to be alone. So God said, here's what is good. I'm going to bring you a suitable helper. Why? Because I am showing you favor. Because I'm showing you unmerited favor. I'm showing you grace. I'm showing you more than you possibly need. And like Quentin said, you already have all you need. 
God says, like, you know what? I'm going to put some extra on top of it. And here's your relationship. Here is a woman that if you get back to me, too, just, just in case you might fall, you have someone else that can help you up. But we're coming back. We're getting together. And how do we know this? Well, let's go to Ephesians 5, start in verse 21. Come on, bro. Guys, still with me? We're so still we'll, with you, bro. Amen. Now, we have to understand something. God was so committed to you that he ensured you had everything you needed for the help that you needed to get back. Are you committed back to God? Are you committed in that first relationship to God that you already have? In Ephesians 5, verse 21, it says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Do you still submit to God, hence the church, out of reverence for Christ? For those that are not married? And for those you are married, do you submit to one another out of reverence for Christ? What I think it's interesting here is it says submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Jesus actually submitted to you. Remember, he had said he was the first husband, right? He submitted to you to a point that he submitted and humbled himself to go on a cure. I'm going to shed my own blood. And if you choose to accept it, we can be one. Do you submit to him to ensure you become one? Yeah, I'll go quiet. I just say you were married, okay? <laughs> Verse 22. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. Mm. For those that are single, do you still submit to the Lord? Yes. For those that are married, do you still submit to your husband as you submit to him? You have to realize that when a husband got married, the commitment was God, the commitment was that you see him as your Lord. You see him as pretty much equal as Jesus. Now, do you think the husband doesn't know that he's not Jesus? <laughs> okay, 100%. Paul's going to be like, I'm not Jesus. Don't hold me to that. I don't want to be held to that. But look at what happens next in verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife. I got no choice. The scripture says I'm the head of the wife. But it comes with a commitment. As Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Here's the first commitment as a husband. Are you willing to give yourself up for your wife? Are you willing to die for her? That's an that's intense commitment. That's the same commitment that Jesus had for each one of us. But then it goes to make her holy. What's the whole point of dying to yourself? So you can be made holy. So it can be set apart. So it can still be one with what? With Jesus. It says cleansing her by the washing with the water through the word. And to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. You guys have to realize that God's commitment, that the call that, has, that God has to husbands as a commitment is this, is that husbands have to and commit to getting back his daughter to heaven the way he gave her to her, to him. Meaning, if Courtney was blameless, if she was radiant, if she had no wrinkle, she had no stain, she was completely blameless right now in her relationship with God before she gets married. If, or, you know, if Quintus so chooses and they all get married, Quintus' commitment is, I'm going to get her back the way you gave her to me. I'm blemished, completely radiant. She's going to be smiling. There's going to be no wrinkles. God, she's going to be exactly the same way you gave her to me. Yeah. I don't know about you. That's kind of scary. <laughs> God, you trust me? I'm just a man. <laughs> but that's exactly what he's saying. He's like, you know what? I'm not going to give you something you can bear. I believe God actually trusts his man to live like Jesus. Whoa. Isn't that what he calls every single man to be before they're married? Yep. To live like Jesus. And if he trusts his man to live like Jesus, then that means that they're called to the same commitment as Jesus. Come on, bro. Women, for those that get married, do, don't don't be deceived and don't let Satan lie to you. God will call your husband to commit. If they fully understand this, they will not take you for granted. Why? Well, the moment that a husband chooses a wife, you become one. And I'll buy you. I love you all, but you ain't perfect. Okay? Each of you guys have your own sin. And the moment that a husband chooses a wife, 
you actually take upon your wife's sin. And if your wife stays in sin because you're one and she chooses to not repent because you're not washing her with the word, where do you think you're going? Uh -huh. <laughs> you became one. You became one in all goodness and in all bad. <laughs> So you better keep your life faithful. I don't know about you, but that's kind of scary on the guys. Like, y'all a little scared now? <laughs> Good. Be grateful that God actually gives you a wife that chooses to submit the way that she chooses to submit to the Lord. And she submits to you in the same way. Because she doesn't. She chose to. She chose to submit in that way. Which means be grateful that you can take care of. Be grateful that she's willing to listen to you and pray for discernment that you're basically leading her the same way that Jesus did. Okay. Why is this a commitment? Well, for those that are not married, you're still committed to Jesus. Man, yeah, lucky yeah. for you guys, Jesus is perfect. That means he's not going to do anything wrong. He's like, Jesus, what did you do? Nothing. It's me. Let me go repent. Okay, I'm back. Good, we're one. See, that's why being single is so much easier. <laughs> Because you don't have to deal with an imperfect husband. Sorry, CL. Right? Right? But, but, I, but I submit to CL a reverence for Christ. Why? Because she teaches me things that I would have never learned without her. I'm probably more of a jerk if I didn't have CL. I'm probably way more fun if I didn't have CL. But I know for a fact... I know for a fact I wouldn't be as gentle. I trust me, I kind of have some rough edges. Okay. <laughs> um, but the truth is, without CO, I would have never learned all these things I had to learn to be more like Jesus. And the entire point of marriage was to become holy. And the whole point of having a suitable helper, hence a wife, was to become one so we can become holy. <laughs> Hence, we come to God. And God's like, it's not good for AJ to be alone because he ain't going to make it without CL. So we're going to unify. <laughs> like, I know that I've been with you for a couple of, you know, 20, 25 years. Let's bring it in. It's time. But God did not bring CL in until I realized who my first love and my first marriage really was. It was to Jesus. Oh, yeah. You have to commit to your marriage. And get God, for those that are single, will bring you a suitable helper to bring you to complete unity with God. You don't become unified with your wife and then with God. You become unified with God and then with your wife. So, so, he did those lessons, bro. Come on, brother. You're all so funny. Well, let's continue to read in verse 28. In the same way, Husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. Hence, here's a commitment. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body, referencing Jesus. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery. Sounds pretty mysterious, I guess. <laughs> but I am talking about what? Christ and the church. However, each, of you, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself. And the wife must respect her husband. I think it's interesting that in verse 31 and in verse 32, it says very simply, you start with like the husband and wife, but then he goes, actually, I'm not talking about marriage. I'm actually just talking about the church and God and Jesus. Meaning that it's really this. There was no difference on the commitment of marriage to God like there was a commitment of marriage to one another. And that's why it applies to everybody who's single, because you are married to Jesus, because he married you first. But are you still submissive to Jesus, even though you're married? Amen. Now, husbands, it says, love his wife as he loves himself. Now, this is intense because we all know, we all talk about love, and I don't have time to go through all the sermons, so we're going to stop right here, you know. But to love your wife, to actually make it a you have to love your neighbor as yourself. And who's your closest neighbor? Your wife. <laughs> I mean, I don't know how close she is my neighbor. She like sleeps next to me. Okay. 
my other neighbor is like a house apart. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? She's my closest neighbor. And if I don't love her like I love myself, I ain't going to make it. You know? So in other words, love each other the way God loves you. He loved you to a point of commitment where he made a vow that until death do you part, and actually went beyond death because he died and you're going to be unified in eternity, you guys will not be separated. So even though there is no physical marriage in, in heaven, there is a spiritual marriage. Yeah. You are married to Jesus even when you're in heaven. Don't you guys want to see God? Yeah. Don't you want to see Jesus in heaven? Yeah. Guys, you will never be disowned by God. You will always be loved by God. You will always be loved by Jesus because he chose you first. You choose him as well. And with that, that's how we become a superman and a superwoman. If you understand that purity is your strength, that the call to singleness, it's not to be single, but it's to be committed to the marriage that you vowed when you said Jesus is Lord, that you vowed when you got baptized because you're committed to them and to God be the Lord. Amen.